let me introduce Professor Wendy Zierler talking today on both these and those, S.Y. Agnon's The Kerchief and Devorah Baron's Trifles in Literary Conversation. Please welcome Professor Zierler. Okay, thank you everybody. Oh, everyone should move up closer so that we can all talk to each other. I really appreciate you mentioning the Agnon and Baron related articles because those articles that Richard was so kind to mention relate to the book project that I'm writing where I am trying to stage a literary chavruta, a conversation between two major uh, Jewish writers. On the one hand, the master uh, Hebrew writer uh, S.Y. Agnon, the only Nobel laureate that Israel has ever had, and his contemporary and friend, the writer Devorah Baron. Uh, I, from the very beginning, my work, out, aside from the film book, my work has asked the question, what happens when women who were totally absent from the Hebrew literary conversation for millennia? I mean, not a single book was published by a woman in the Hebrew language until the end of the 19th century. So you consider millennia of, of scholarly productivity and literary works that women played no role in, with the, with the exception of a handful of poems. You know, from the closing of the Bible, the canonization of the Bible, to the modern period. So I've always been concerned, obsessed with the question of what happens when women finally join the conversation. How do they rewrite canonical conversations? How do they overturn previous representations of women? And I found that uh, much of my early writing was in a kind of gotcha mode which is to say, trying to point out that like blatant misogyny of certain texts and showing the ways in which women writers kind of say gotcha. <laughs> they, the women writers insist on introducing an entirely different facet. And in my first book, I have a chapter in which I look at, for example, the representation of barrenness, the theme of barrenness, age-old theme in the Bible, and how men have always written about that, and what happens when women finally represent barrenness. And so I staged this conversation between Agnon and Baron. And from, that was the, the germ of what I I'm going to expand on with you today. So I'm currently writing this book where each chapter is a conversation between two texts, one, two stories, one by Agnon, one by Baron on the same topic. And in this instance, wary of the way in which I, in a gotcha mode, have maybe participated in the increased rancor of conversation in America, where feminism is like a, a, a stab in the back of the patriarchy, I'm really interested in seeing the ways in which we can have a conversation, where differing points of view can be honored. We, we will eventually perhaps side with one over the other, but after the manner of the rabbis, who um, famously, in the, uh, as we will see in um, the Babylonian Talmud, Eruvin 13b, uh, there is a, a a famous statement um, in the name of Abba, um, Amma, Abba and, uh, who said in the name of Shmuel, that for three years, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel were at loggerheads with one another, arguing about every manner of, of legal issue, um, until finally uh, Batkol, a heavenly voice, came and said, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim, both these and those are the words of the living God. So I'm going to say both Agnon and Baron, their stories are the words of the living God. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to skew in the direction, as you'll see, of um, a certain argument in favor of Baron's feminist contribution to the conversation. Uh, the Gemara goes on, the, the Babylon, Babylonian Talmud goes on to say that the reason why most of our rulings are in favor of the house of Hillel over Shammai was not because Hillel always had the most trendy or correct 
stance, but because of the way Hillel conducted, the House of Hillel conducted themselves, that they um, were very forbearing and agreeable, and because they would always teach Beit Shammai statements before their own. So in this instance, I'll be teaching the, the Agnon story first, I'll be teaching the Baron story second, I will be making a feminist argument or something of an intervention by way of this um, Baron story, but hopefully it will be in service of the idea of both these and those represent the, the point of view of the, the living God, and because I have great appreciation for both of these writers, I, I am, uh, one will never get from me um, a trash talk about the great Nobel laureate um, S.Y. Agnon. So let me tell you a bit about these writers. Um, I'm sure some of you, I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with who um, Agnon was, but you may not be familiar with Baron, so just a little nano bit about these two writers. Uh, Agnon's dates are 1888 to 1970, Baron is 1887 to 1956, so you see that they were direct contem contemporaries. Not just that, they um, wrote in a similar way. They distinguished themselves for uh, the very, very midrashic quality of their writing. You'll see in both of these stories that I'm going to talk about today uh, an explicit engagement with Talmudic sources for the purpose, now they're both imagining an ideal readership that is familiar with the original uh, rabbinic source and therefore can recognize where the writing tweaks it deletes, adds, um, and therefore um, the, the subtle intervention is made. So I'm going to coax you in the direction of their midrashic reading. Um, they both were seen on some level because of this a little out, um, outmoded. Both of them insisted on writing a lot about the old world. So they're living in the heart of, of first Palestine and then the state of Israel, and yet returning over and over again to the world of their, of their youth. And in that world, the heady time of the building of the, of, of the Zionist enterprise and then the state of Israel, to insist all the time on, on writing about your Lithuanian shtetl or your Galician shtetl was something of a backward move. And so they shared that backwardness. Beyond that, they were friends. They met each other in um, 1910 in Nevet Zedek, where they both lived, so that was this Jewish neighborhood in Yafo. They, um, uh, Bar Baron immigrated to Palestine uh, um, in 1910, and very quickly, because she was something of a phenom, she started publishing stories in Hebrew and in Yiddish when she was just a teenager, as did Agnon. They were both preternaturally <laughs> gifted and, and precocious. Uh, she was quickly hired to be the literary editor of Hapoel Atzair, uh, the major labor Zionist newspaper, and she edited some of the first stories that Agnon published in the Hebrew language in Israel. Uh, they knew each other, they visited each other, we have letters back and forth. When Agnon left Palestine, he had immigrated in 1909, when he left in 1912, only three years after he arrived, to Germany, he gave his curtains to Baron and her husband, right? So we know that they were friends, we know that they worked together, and we in fact have a copy, we'll see it later, of the book Ktanot, Trifles, that, that's the book that this story um, was the title story of, hand and to Agnon. So I, I'm going to be arguing that there really was an extant literary conversation between these two stories. I think that the comparisons between them, the many similarities, make that an easy argument to make. But even if there weren't, I believe in this idea of, just like the rabbis, we, we pretend as though these, these texts inhabit the same study space, and we'll make them speak with one another and see how that turns out. Now, the, the thematic organizational uh, theme, the motif that I want to explore together with you uh, by uh, these two stories is the idea of the large and the small. The large and the small, and the significance of large and small as overarching structuring metaphors. 
This idea of a metaphor being an, not just a decorative matter, not just a turn of phrase, but really um, a conditioning, deep structure in the way that we think comes not you know, out of the genius of my mind, it comes via the, the linguists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson in, a, in a, a book they wrote from 1980 called Metaphors We Live By, where they talk about metaphor not just as a matter of language or words, but that it's part of our deep thought processes. And so there are certain metaphors that just speak to a whole range of, pre, of presuppositions in society. And now apropos of large and small, uh, there is a, a moment in Lakoff and Johnson's metaphors we live by where they enlarge, pardon the pun, on the idea of, la of the large, what its social and religious and psychological significance is. So sig large is significant. A big man in the garment industry, a giant among writers, the biggest idea to hit advertising in years. He's head and shoulders above everyone in the industry. That was one of the greatest moments in World Series history. His accomplishments tower over those of lesser men. Now, what do you notice about all of the examples that Lakoff brings? Know that I'm a feminist literary scholar. So what are we noticing about the gendered nature of these various metaphors of the large? Okay, so they just nom dominance, and how are they gendered? Who is the dominant? Okay, every one of them is a masculine metaphor. And I want to suggest, because I'm, attentive, I'm, re, I'm taking Lakoff and Johnson at their own word, that they recognize that the language that we use represents deep structures in our mind, so it's not an accident that all of the metaphors of significance are masculine. So when we talk about the literature of the large and the small, or when we think about images of large and small, many things come to our mind. Uh, large fathers, small children, um, differences between s large cities and small towns, or um, important ideas and trivial ideas. Um, I want to explore with you how these deep metaphors or linguistic structures translate specifically in Jewish culture and um, because be, excuse me, because we'll be looking at a number of instances in Agnon's story and in Baron's story of the use of the word gadol, large, or the or um, in the case of the Baron story, which is called ktanot, um, small women, um, small things, katnut. Perhaps you could vocalize that way means triviality. To what extent is everything trivial? gendered feminine, and everything significant, gendered masculine. Um, there's a statement on the part of the rabbis, and this is a legal statement, that uh, the value of a deed that's performed by someone who is commanded to do that deed is greater, is larger than someone who does it who is not commanded. Well, given that women in a number of instances are exempt halachically from performing certain mitzvot. That means that perforce, their performance of these mitzvot are going to be lesser. Um, now, the twist, of course, is that Jewish tradition, over and over and over again, despite its emphasis on primogeniture, on this idea that the bachor, the firstborn, is, is supposed to be given special rights, that's constantly being overturned um, in our tradition, which is interesting. Even encoded within the masculine patriarchal line, we have a kind of upendedness of largeness. Um, that means that it's always interesting to see when your tradition shows a counter-traditional strain. But we'll be observing some of these phenomena in these two stories. Now, just to move now specifically into the nuts and bolts of the Agnon story. The Agnon story, Hamit Pachat, was published in 1932. It was written originally as a gift for this person, Gideon Shoken, who is the son of Zalman Shoken, uh, Agnon's patron. When Agnon left Palestine in 1912 and moved to Germany, he had the great fortune of befriending 
and coming under the, the patronage of Zalman Shulkin, who was a department store owner, um, an important publisher. To this day, you all know Shulkin Books. Uh, you may know as well that the Shulkin family owns the newspaper Haaretz. Uh, Agnon had the good fortune of getting signed <laughs> drafted and signed by the Shokens, um, which meant that for the, his entire life, he had a guaranteed venue pipeline for his publications. It, one might argue that he could have made more money if he were not signed for life to the Shokens because he could have bargained and um, tried to get a better, better price, but he did have a sort of stability and a, a constancy to his life, which en enabled him to succeed on the level that he did succeed. And in gratitude to the Shokin family for what they had done for him, Agnon gave a bar mitzvah present to Gideon Shokin, which was the story Hamid Pachat, the kerchief, which was published 13 pages, 13 lines, 13 chapters. Everything about the format of this story was done so that it called attention to the fact that it was a bar mitzvah story. In fact, one can argue that the story tracks the development of the protagonist, the first person narrator of the story, from being a small boy, from smallness to age of majority. It takes us to his bar mitzvah day. It takes him from his myopic, narcissistic, self-centered, little boy's cute, cute, cute view to a serious engagement um, and responsibility, a sense of responsibility with the larger world, which was meant to be, you know, my bracha for you on your bar mitzvah, Gideon Shulkin, son of major wealthy patrons, publishers who have great responsibility for the work that they do, you know, to inculcate that sense of significance. To the day. My husband and I like to joke about the thank you card that Gideon Shoken might have written to S.Y. Agnon. Dear Mr. Agnon, thank you so much for the story you wrote me for my bar mitzvah. I hope one day that I'll understand it. <laughs> right? It's, so it's, it's important to know this, I guess, paratextual, paratextual aspect, like this, um, both to, to, look, to look at how the text looked to see how it would so explicitly, physically set out to be a bar mitzvah boy, it, a small size, but meant something that he could, a lesson he could take with him for his life. Those of you, some of you who are in my Agnon group know that um, the story is narrated by this first person narrator reflecting back on his childhood. So on the one hand, the narrative sounds like a, a child's eye point of view, but we know throughout the story actually that that narrator is no longer a child. We know that, why? Why do we know that? Because throughout the story, he refers to Abba Zichrono Livracha, my father of blessed memory, and Ima Aleha Shalom, my, ma my mother, may peace be with her. So this is a young boy and an adult at the same time. And it's bringing those two points of view to the story that is part of the gift. A sense of, I understand you, Bar Mitzvah boy, where you are, but I also want to lead you somewhere. And now throughout, uh, of course, if we had three hours or two weeks or three weeks to, to study together, we would go through each one of these references, the many references in the story to things large, things large that the boy is scared of, things large that he's impressed by, that he sees himself small in relation to, the great sense of awe that he feels having Shabbat with his parents after his father returns home from a trip. Um, I, I array these before you visually so you can see just how much greatness, how much of an obsession there is in this story with leading this boy to a sense of what the large is, what it means to inhabit the age of majority. So let me uh, quickly tell you about this boy. This boy has a father who's a merchant who goes away every year to a major fair in Lashkovitz, which I actually took the trouble recently to look up where Lashkovitz is. From the description of it, it would seem to be that it's a million miles away. It was just like a suburb away from, from Buchach, where Agnon lived. I found it on the map. So we think about going to the mall. 
um, the kind of mall that you have to get on a highway to go to. But for a little boy, that could seem like a world away. Um, a fair that might have attracted hundreds of people, but for him it seems as though the entire world comes together in this fair. The week that his father is away, he says, is compared to, in his, in his family's mind, to the nine days before Tisha B'Av. So the father's absence is likened to the absence of God, the seeming absence of God upon the destruction of the temple. And so the entire story, in a sense, from the very beginning, is projecting this child's eye, myopic, narcissistic view against the larger fate of the people of Israel. To what extent is this boy going to be able to emerge into a sympathy for the larger fate of the people of Israel? Um, in, while his father is away, he likes, he's sort of sad that his dad's away, but he's sort of psyched that his father is away, because when his father is away, he gets to lie down in his father's bed and stretch out, well, Agnon read Freud, like stretch out into his father's bed and play at being larger. And while he, li he lay in his father's bed, he meditates on his superhero, his superhero being the Messiah, the superhero, his superhero being the Messiah as the Messiah is represented in the Babylonian Talmud 98a, as a beggar with many, many sores sitting among all the, uh, all the other beggars outside of the gates of Rome. And the only thing that distinguishes that beggar from all the other beggars, those of you who are familiar with the, this moment in um, Sanhedrin 98a, is that this particular beggar, when he unwraps, redoes his bandages, he does it one at a time, rather than taking them all off at once, so that at any moment he'll be ready to greet the Messiah. So this boy loves to fantasize about this Messiah coming and what it will be like when this beggar um, is announced to be the Messiah. While he's lying in his father's bed, he has such a dream where a, a great bird would come and spread his wings and fly him to a city called Rome. And there, in his dream, he actually sees a group of poor men sitting in the gates of the city, one beggar among them binding his wounds in that precise way. But what does he do in response to seeing this at this early juncture in the story? Instead of looking at this beggar with his eyes and taking in the suffering, he has to avert his eyes. He has to look away. And so it's a mark of his inchoate, not yet ready state that he can't look at the suffering in the face. That's where the story, in a sense, begins. With him fancying himself a great proponent or a great fan of the Messiah, but not really being able to take on board, take responsibility for what that redemption the, would, would look like. So that's one instance where Agnon is reading midrashically through the Talmud and using a discrepancy in a Talmudic narrative to show you where his protagonist is sitting at that moment. Um, and there are two other instances like that. And we will see parallel instances in Baron's stories, where she'll also have three, roughly three or four moments, where there will be allusions to uh, moments, specific moments, either in Midrash or in the Babylonian Talmud. And the discrepancies will show you something significant about the character at hand. So another story that uh, comes up is, the, is one of the many legends of a man named Nahum Ish Gamzu. Nahum Ish Gamzu, why is he called Nahum Ish Gamzu? Those of you who know who this guy is? Absolutely. Everything that happens to him, he says, Gamzu Latova. Even this terrible thing that's happened to me where I've been stricken with every manner of illness, it'll all work out in the end. A famous, a famous kind of miracle worker saint. Um, now, why does Nahum Ish Gamzu come up in the Agnon story? Agnon's dad has gone away on a business trip. Now, what do parents do when they go on business trips? Good parents? Buy presents. Buy presents for their children. Thank you. 
So Agnon's dad has come home, and the kids are waiting for the presents. And the father is lingering over the trunks. And the boy says, is it possible that he lost the presents? Did he not get any presents? Had he been, lo had he been lodging at an inn where the inn people rose and took out the presents? As happened with the sage by whose hands they sent a gift to the emperor, a chest full of jewels and pearls, and when he lodged one night at the inn, the inn folk opened the chest and took out everything that was in it and filled it with dust. Then I prayed that just as a miracle was done to that sage, so that dust should be the dust of Abraham our father, which turned into swords when it was thrown into the air. So should the Holy One, blessed be he, perform a miracle with us, in order that the things which the innkeepers had filled Father's trunk should be better than all presents. Okay, just so that in case you didn't follow my quick reading. Nakumish Gamzu was designated because of his incredible piety and his miracle working capabilities to bring tribute to the emperor. He was sent with a trunk full of precious jewels and coins. While he's staying at an inn, the innkeeper and thugs rob him of all of his jewels and his coins that he's supposed to bring to the emperor for the entire Jewish people and replace it with dirt. He gets to Rome, he's got dirt. That's not a good situation. Elijah, the prophet, thank God, shows up, always comes at the right time, turns this dirt, he actually comes and speaks to the emperor and says, you know this dirt, this isn't just dirt. This is the holy dirt of Abraham that if you throw up, up in the air, it turns into swords, and lo and behold, miraculously, it does. The emperor wins the war with the sword dirt, and in tribute, pays, refills the coffer that Nahum Ishgamzu came with, with precious jewels and coins. All's well that ends well, Gamzu Latova. Everything is for the good. Agnon's childish narrator is worried that his presence from his dad might not be there, so maybe they can have a handy miracle. Now, what is conspicuously missing from this narrator's version of the story in comparison to the version that I just narrated to you. Okay, Elijah's not there. None of the danger is there. None of the life and death harrowing danger Right, this is a story that really hangs on the edge of disaster. For this boy, it's like, I better get my presents. <laughs> so the sense of, of large, looming, crushing responsibility that attaches to this chest, that's completely missing from this boy's narcissistic filtering of the story. This, too, has to be filtered out. <laughs> the boy has to be made, to, has to be made larger. Yes? And also that part of what happens when now the thug, the innkeeper, trying to play the same game, but they are killed. Well, that's a that my little piece. That yes, the really dark part about the fact that the innkeeper tries to pull the same shtick and then he gets his pardon me gets his comeuppance. That too is extracted. So any of the the darker content, the difficult, life-threatening content of the story that isn't there, and on some level it has to be brought clearer into the light so that this boy can become an adult. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll skip the next one. So you see, you see the movement. The story is going to take us through this boy's mindset until he gets to the point where he can really serve the world. And in fact, he can serve as a model for Gideon Shokin. Now, part of the gift story, I've told you about his obsession with getting a gift for himself, really at the center of the story is not the gifts that the children get, but the gifts that the mom gets which is a kerchief, an extraordinary kerchief that is described as silk brocaded kerchief adorned with flowers and blossoms. On the one side it was brown and they were white, the flowers, and on the other side they were brown and it was white. So it's, it's, it, it was not only beautiful, but it was reversible. That's always cool for kids, right? That was the gift which Father of Blessed Memory bought to Mother, peace be with her. 
Okay, now what is notable about, you, know, you should know the, the kerchief is not just a beautiful kerchief, it seem, it's a magical kerchief. It's a kerchief that she wears all the time or she wears several times a year, but it never seems to need laundering. It's pristine. It is a marker rit ritually of Kisui Rosh, of female modesty, but it too seems to be above the vicissitudes of fortune. Um, it can't be sullied. Um, and, and in that sense, in being so haloed a kerchief, a kerchief, you know, so holy a kerchief, um, one has to ask whether it's a legendary object as much as it is an actual material object. I should note the significance of the kerchief in this story in relation to the slippers in the Baron story. So both of these stories hinge on a feminine adornment a female accessory and its relationship to the protagonist. Why do you think he chooses to have the kerchief be brown and white? I like brown. I have a lot of brown clothes. But if one were to choose a color for a kerchief that is supposed to be kind of the platonic ideal of beautiful, would you choose brown and white? No. So then why does he choose brown and white? What is brown and white? Back up. The earth is brown. Okay, the earth is brown. And there is some sort of intimation. If one is going to talk about flowers and brown, one does get an intimation. What happens when flowers are turning brown? I bought, my daughter graduated from a master's program on Friday. I went to get her flowers very quickly before the ceremony, and then I was horrified to discover that one of the white roses was brown. Right, so there is some intimation of death in a brown and white flower, but where else would you see brown and white as a color scheme? To guide us about what the story, one of the ways in which we should understand the story. So brown and white is sepia. Brown and white is sepia. And this entire story, in a sense, is tinged in sepia because of its nostalgic back glance. Um, it's a story about loss as much as it is a story about knowledge gained or maturity. Uh, we'll, we'll see this more clearly as we, um, in a moment. Um, the mother has this kerchief. And it re remains, at, like I said, above the vicissitudes of fortune, except she decides on the day of her son's bar mitzvah that she's going to take it out of its pristine place and tie it around his neck, kind of like a necktie for the day of his bar mitzvah. And that fateful decision, in a sense, to try and bind him to her, we, we, we often talk about the binding of Isaac, right? But this is the binding of the bar mitzvah boy to his mother's ways. That spells the undoing of this kerchief because on the day that the boy goes to shul for his bar mitzvah, it's during a weekday because he puts on tefillin for the first time. We don't put on tefillin on, on Shabbat. That day, he actually runs into a beggar like the one that he had a dream about in earlier on in the story and sees a, a real-life beggar binding his sores, barely able to cover his sores with all the bandages. And in looking at this beggar and forcing, training his eyes on this beggar and taking on the responsibility of accounting for and witnessing the suffering, he fun suddenly finds the need to widen, to give himself space. He's feeling choked. He undoes the kerchief, and he gives it to the beggar to bind his wounds with. And so at that very moment of his bar mitzvah, his mitzvah project, so to speak, is that he takes this pre precious, guarded, domestic, feminine object and sullies it with the tough stuff of the real world. One can argue that in order for him to reach the age of majority, what he has to do is unbind himself from the domestic ways and the, the holy strictures of his home 
forego that connection with his mother, the feminine trifle that it is, so that he can demonstrate responsibility, not waiting for the Messiah, but taking the responsibility into his own hands. On some level, this is a parable about Zionist activism, rather than sitting in the old world and waiting for the Messiah, that hinges on disconnecting from the feminine. Moving, the fe in that case, the feminine is the realm of the small. When you become a bar mitzvah, you are a gadol. You, in the eyes, you are, you are large. You are the age of majority in the eyes of halacha. Okay. There's much more that I would want to say about this. Um, I'll just note that it appears at the end of the story, if we were to read it together, we would note that it appears at the end of the story that his father has now died because his mom is sitting out by the window in a kind of more position of mourning in the way that she would when his father would be away. And so the father being dead, if it takes us back to the earlier part of the story where the father being away was likened to the nine days before the um, Tisha B'Av. The father is not just the father, his own dad, but on some level stands for God the Father. In the absence of d obvious divine intervention, Prevention. Human beings, here writ masculine, have to step into the world, get themselves dirty, and fix it. And that is what Agnon's story offers Gideon Shokin on the day of his bar mitzvah. Thank you, that's why Agnon, for this interesting story you gave me for my bar mitzvah. Now, so what do, how do I want um, this conversation to take place between Agnon and Baron? Both of them are, like I said, midrashically oriented writers, writers that are interested in showing the ways in which their old world characters filter their experiences through classical sources. But in Baron's case, she is obsessed with showing those parts of the Jewish community that are often s below the radar of the canonical texts because they pertain to what would be trivial or everyday or small or like sub-canonical in Jewish life. Here um, I'm leading with a quotation from a feminist anthropologist named Susan Starr Sered who did a study on the religious lives of Yemenite women in Jerusalem. And she notes that feminist scholarship of the last two decades, the sort that I've been involved, has offered critiques of almost every aspect of society, countless books and articles describing women's oppression in economic, political, medical, social, familial, legal, religious, and academic institutions. And so all these places where women haven't been treated properly. But what she set out to do is to talk about those areas where women had agency, or the, the types of culture that they invented. Um, so less known is the strategies that women have used to circumvent patriarchal institutions, the techniques women have created for making their own lives meaningful within androcentric culture, the ways in which women have developed their own little tradition within and or parallel to the great tradition. So here I'm sticking to the nomenclature of little and, and big or small and large, but I'm suggesting that one of the ways that feminist writers and critics can intervene is to assign new value to those things that were previously deemed insignificant or not noticed. And so this story by Baron, which was published a year later, um, a year after Agnon's um, Pachat is explicitly about the small, about um, the small doings and chores that women perform. It's about a small feminine decorative object, a pair of embroidered slippers that the protagonist just yearns for. Um, so in contradistinction to the Agnon story, which is a, about renouncing or giving up a feminine trifle for the sake of a larger participation in the world, this story is about acquiring an object of feminine beauty and what that might mean for this protagonist who's living in a small town under the thumb of her mean, nasty mother-in-law, who is a someone worse than the, than the patriarch is the matriarch who s supports the androcentric culture, the, the phallic woman who props herself up and the patriarchy at the expense of other women. Here is uh, the cover of, of Baron's Ktanot, 
it looks much bigger on the screen than it is in real life. It's a really small book. So all it has is just her name in cursive on the front. It only has three stories in it. Um, in this particular copy of Baron's uh, Tanot, we see a dedication to Shai Agnon. She gave it to him as a copy. So this is a copy of her book that's in Agnon's library in Agnon House in Jerusalem. And it says, Shai Agnon Hamishorer, to, Ag to Agnon the poet. Why the poet? She herself was always called, as a, because she wrote short stories and not long novels, she was called Hamishoreret Beproza. So she was always deemed on, on some level like a lesser writer for writing in short form. Berig um, with feelings of fondness, and she just signs Hamechaberet the writer. Now, why is that significant? In um, Jewish law, Hamechaber, the Mechaber, is Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. So to call yourself Hamechaberet is not a small thing. It's in a sense to try and insert yourself in a very large, conspicuous way, or to insist that your small contributions be valued it's hard to get outside of the trap of the language because no, ma no matter how I speak, if I'm saying significant on some level, I'm reinforcing this whole linguistic pattern. So what is the meaning of the title Ktanot? Why is it called Ktanot? So it, on one, you know, there are several ways that we can understand it. The word Ktanot appears a few times in the stories. It referring to the, the protagonist's little daughters, the little girls, Asher Hen HaKtanot. Her father, who is a miller, the, the, the Rebbanit of this town, um, the Rebetzin of this town, in contrast to the old Rebetzin, her mother-in-law, has these little daughters that she'll send off every so often to be, to, to be taken care of, to be coddled by her father, the miller. Um, she has an unlearned but somewhat wealthy father um, who is a miller, and it's because of that money that comes from her family that her husband, who is sickly and tubercular, is able to secure the rabbinic post that he has in the town. So there's a whole question of what is valued, the Torah learning versus the, the kindness or the earthiness or the capacity of, of people with other jobs. So Ktanot, the little people, are either girls or they're people like this miller who are seen as little in terms of their stature because they don't have money. Um, often women were associated with ame ha'aretz, men who didn't know anything. If we think about the history of Jewish books, Yiddish prayers that were written for women or the tzenarena, the Yiddish uh, midrashic work on, on the weekly Torah, por Torah portion, it was for women and men who were like women in that they didn't have great learning. So there are many, uh, many individuals uh, that come under this category of what is small in this story. Um, small things, little women, minor characters, trivial chores. Uh, one should add to this uh, a statement from the Mishnah Sota 3-4, one of the most famous statements in the, history, you know, in the history of rabbinic literature as pertains to women, um, Rabbi Eliezer famously said that anyone who teaches his Torah, his daughter Torah, it's as if he taught her tiflut. Tiflut. Tiflut is, can be translated alternatively in two ways, either as licentiousness, and that's because it comes up in the context of laws regarding the wayward wife, the sota, or something that is tafel, tiflut is something that's trivial. So to teach your daughter Torah is to teach her something trivial because the women won't have the capacity to actually get the large significance of what they're learning. So all of these associations come together into this story. Uh, the personal rather than the communal, something that's an accessory as opposed to the thing that's the core. Something like shoes that are on your feet as opposed to in your head. 
Um, I'll add to this one more point. So we saw in the Agnon story that the narrator showed how his child's eye view read the world through the lens of rabbinic sources or the Bible. And the point of that is to enlarge the significance. It, the story is not just about you, but it has a potential allegorical meaning that goes beyond you. And so there's a sense in which meaning is larger if it goes beyond the literal. The story is more significant if it's not just about an individual. The sufferings of a woman they're not really significant. What matters is if they're an allegory for the sufferings of, of Am Yisrael. So in Isaiah, if there is a woman who's desolate in spirit, it's not really a woman that we're talking about. It's the people of Israel who are as if abandoned by God. What Agnon, uh, what, pardon me, what Baron does rather consistently in this story and in others is de-allegorize. So move it small insist before we talk about the allegory or the larger symbolism, let's talk about the thing itself. Let's, if we're gonna talk about women's suffering, let's talk about women's suffering first before we hop on, you know, hop over to its, its allegorical or metaphorical meaning. Okay. So a, a few points about how she does this and how she uses, she de-allegorizes or, or undercuts the effort to try and move something to a Talmudic place as opposed to keeping it real where, where we are. Um, I mentioned there is the narrator, the narrator of the story and the, the protagonist that she's narrating. Okay, so we've got a kind of alter ego, someone who st stands for the younger Devorah Barun, who is present in the story as a, as a first person narrator, but the story's not about her. She is looking at um, the life of her aunt, who she goes to visit on a regular basis uh, because it's good, she's sent to get out in the country, it's nice and healthy. And so she's reflecting on her aunt, the Rabbanit's life. And this is an unhappy woman who's married to a sickly rabbi with a domineering mother. So she has this domineering mother-in-law who's constantly in her face. Um, who sees the fact that her son had to marry her as a great come down. Mm -hmm. And this mother-in-law is constantly boasting to herself in her own mind about how wonderful her lineage is and how this daughter-in-law is nothing. And one of the ways in which she boasts, um, is, is she looks back, you know, the, the story looks back at her past and remembers how it is that she got her son this job describes how she brought her other son for the, the tryout, the rabbinic tryout that weekend, and the two of them being called to the Torah is likened to the experience of someone named Kimchit from the Babylonian Talmud Yoma uh, 47a. And Kimchit was a special woman in that she had seven sons, all of whom served as the high priest at one point in their lives. And so she imagines herself kind of after the manner of Kimchit, um, except for the fact that the only way that Kimchit could have had all of her seven sons be the Kohen Gadol is either because she lost some children or her, her sons were not ritually pure. So on some, and Kim Khi is asked, how is it that she was able to merit this? Well, it's because I was extremely punctilious about the way that I covered my hair. And I never let my hair see the rafters. And the rabbis reject that and they say that, that that's not a good um, explanation because we know other people who were punctilious about covering their hair and they never merited that. So what I, I mention this because this rabbi, this old Rebetzin is always throwing out Talmudic verse to prop herself up, but she never quite recognizes the implications of the sources that she's quoting. And in, if anything, what the stories do is show that her learning is not quite that extensive, that it's, um, it's, it's, it's shockingly lacking in context. And moreover, what is the word kimchit? What does that bring to mind? 
Kemach. So Kimbrit makes us think about the fact that in Em Kemach in Torah, if you don't have flour, you can't have a, a rabbinic position. And if not for the miller, the, the rab, Rabbanit's wife, there never would have been um, the Torah in this family. So I'm going to skip ahead um, so that I can give you the ending of the story and um, show you the way in which it kind of undercuts the ending of Hamid Pachat. So in addition to telling us about the everyday life of these women, a lot of their chores, a lot of the incidental things that many stories like to leave out because they're about women's everyday lives, um, there is, a, there's a tragedy at the heart of the story, which is uh, that Rabbanit lives next to um, a cobbler and his wife. The cobbler, so shoes, the cobbler beats his wife and beats his daughters. He beats his wife because his wife only gives him daughters. And she only gives him daughters, it happens to be, she's on a cycle of giving birth every year around that time between um, Shivasar Batamuz and Kisha Ba'av. So during that same heady time that the Hamid Pachat story is staged. And so at the heart of this story is an insistence on looking at the, at the abuse of women, not as an allegory, but as an embodied thing. Uh, the eldest daughter and the Rabbanit are friends. And this eldest daughter is sent to the city, to Kovno as it turns, to work as a domestic. And that whole question of women's labor is also, inter you know, in the modern period is raised in the story. Um, while she's working for this, well, while she's working for this family in Kovno, she comes home on Shabbat Nachamu, that's the Saturday after Tisha B'Av, the consolation Shabbat when we read the Haftarah, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, my people, my people, be comforted, be comforted. Uh, she comes home for a visit and the Rabbanit and this Chana Gittel, their friends, they get together for a Saturday night talk. This is very important because later, Chana Gittel is accused by her employers of letting in robbers into the, into the house, somehow staging, um, helping to abet a robbery. And because they got together as friends, two women, the kind of thing that is under the radar in, in much of the literature written by men in the Hebrew language, she's able, she is summoned to Kovno to testify so that she can exonerate her friend from these charges of a conspiracy, conspiracy to commit robbery. This rabbi's wife, who in a rabbinic court wouldn't be allowed to testify because women are not allowed to serve as, as witnesses, she is able to go out into the world and perform this redemptive act. And while she is there, she happens to wander into a store where she sees this pair of beautiful embroidered slippers. She had seen a pair just like that earlier on in the story at the home of the narrator's, at the narrator's home. The narrator's mom had such a pair of slippers. And this small tongue rabbi's wife, all she wanted was to get hold of a pair of slippers like this. And because she was able to have this moment of communion with a friend, which in turn is able to allow her to do a real world act, a redemptive act, akin to what the boy does at the end of, of the kerchief by giving um, out his kerchief. She is able to have this experience where she's able to acquire this wonderful set of, of slippers, which for her are, are um, a treasured, not a triviality, but um, a treasured acquisition and a moment that is likened yeah, through the use of the word teva and the, the rainbow in the sky to a kind of Noahide end of the flood redemptive moment. So what we see here, is a story that is explicitly engaging in the same sorts of modes of Agnon's story. That some of this a similar writing method, but for the purpose of calling attention not to the large or the masculine, but to this small and the feminine, uh, to valorize it and make it a subject worthy of conversation and adulation and appreciation. So I think we've come to the end of the first session of our uh, celebration. <laughs>